Hi and welcome back to my channel. In today's video you have my June wrap up. I thought there was a high chance that I would not read as many books in the month of June. Instead, somehow, I read the second highest number of any month this year. But let's look at a brief overview of my stats. I'm going to move over a little bit so that I can pop them up here. As I mentioned, I read 34 books. That is a total page count of over 11,000 pages. That does include audiobook hours translated into pages. Average pages per day, 386. I still, I don't know how I did that. Average page count is 340. My most read genre is fantasy. No one's surprised there. Books with rep, 30 out of the 34. Not too shabby. And authors read from before, only eight out of the 34 books. So a lot of brand new authors. If we get into my ratings breakdown, this is a lower average than any of the months. And unfortunately that's because I had a one star this month. I also had two, two and a half stars. So even though overwhelmingly four and a half stars were, four, four and a half stars were the largest categories, it does bring my average down. I had, apart from those one and two and a half stars, five, three stars, four, three and a half stars, 10, four stars, seven, four and a half stars and two five stars. As far as series go, as I mentioned, working through all the book box books, there's going to be a lot of series started. But in this case, there are a few series started that I am not continuing. So here are the series started. The one for the series starting that I have specifically is The Ruin of Kings. I will be continuing in this one. There's a total of seven and I think some of these are arcs that I do not have physically so it would be up to me to try to remember. One of them I, that I will be continuing with is Nick Blake and the Remarkables. I will be continuing in that series. I will also be continuing in the Silver and the Bone series. The two series that I will not be continuing on that I quote unquote started this month, Mindwalker, didn't realize this was a series until I looked it up, and Foxglove King. I also started this Poison Heart duology, I will be completing this one as well. I'm not really sure what my continuing series are. I do know that the one that I finished is this series of companion novels, the Love and series. So format breakdown. You can see here I had 13 physical, 14 audiobook, and 6 ebooks. The 6 ebooks I read while I was on vacation so that I didn't have to, you know, lug physical books with me in my bag. Then the acquired breakdown. I got through 14 arcs. I'm pretty pleased with that. All of those have actually been published. I'm not quite up to date on that yet. And but I did get through 14 of them. 15 of these books I owned and five of them were from the library. Mostly my SCSL books. For my other lists. The one list I mentioned that I haven't gotten to in a couple months is clearing off my oldest TBR books. Then we have the series to start in 2023, Ruin of Kings. I like this one. So far I have had wins with everything, go every single series I specifically put on that list. Then we have my 23 and 23 books. I have to admit, I put this one on there, not realizing that I'd already read it. I read it in 2020. And then the other 23 and 23 book is A Seed in the Sun by Ada Salazar. This was definitely a win. The series that I specifically finished, Love and Luck, as I mentioned. As far as nonfiction, I had one arc, Pork Bailey Tacos with a Side of Anxiety. I also had my Buzzwordathon book, which is Bravey. I thought it was emotions. It's not. That, that was Dread Nation. It is having the word other on the title. And then the other nonfiction is Choosing to Run by Des Linden. And then we get to my book box books because of audiobook download issues. I did end up reading another one that was an ARC as well, but it also fits as a book box book. So one of these got duplicated. For Illumicrate, we have The Drowned Woods. For Book of the Month, we have As Long as the Lemon Trees Grow. For Fairy Loot, we have Princess of Souls. For Aardvark, we have The Night Ship. For Caffeine and Legends, we have The Fairy Bargains of Prospect Hill. For Goldsboro, we have Mindwalker. For 
TBR or tailored book recommendations, we have the sentence. A hardcover for fairy loot. This is the duplicate. We have silver in the bone. And for fairy loot adult, we have Foxglove King by Hannah Witten. Okay, so here we go. Rapid fire because I have 33 books to talk about. 34, if I can remember. Uh, some of them I spent a, a little bit more time talking about because it was before I realized I was going to go rapid fire through these. If you see a change in the outfit, that's because those are the library books that I had to get back. So starting off with the books that I did not uh, rate, and those are the two memoirs that I read. One was an ARC, uh, Pork Belly Tacos with a Side of Anxiety. I was really into this at first, and I thought it was going to lead up to something as she's describing how certain things developed in her life. But then she kept making the same mistakes over and over and over again never really learning from it. You only get the epilogue where she talks about how she's improved and she's so much better, but you don't see how she gets there. It was a little bit disappointing, but I don't read memoirs. So next we have Brady by Alexi Pappas, who is a runner who has competed for Greece in the marathon, American born, Greek heritage. I thought this was a really fascinating exploration into her life and all the things that affected her as a kid, like her mother's battles with mental illness and how she experienced that and her mother's untimely death at her own hands when Alexi was a child. The whole thing was phenomenal, right up until the last bit where she starts turning it into a teaching lesson, which I understand why she might be driven to do that. I just, it didn't fit the flow of the narrative up until that point. Lastly, we have one along the same theme, but not one that I planned. I had tried to read this in a previous month, I think April for Ramathon. Didn't get the audiobook until this month, Choosing to Run uh, by Des Linden. Des Linden is one of my favorite American marathoners, favorite runners, period. And this was very well written. I learned a lot throughout this that made it just overwhelmingly fantastic. And she continues to be one of my favorite American marathoners. So it's probably a really good thing that I didn't talk about this book when I first finished it because it made me really angry. This probably will go down as my worst book this year. Probably my worst book for a while. So this was one of the arcs that I had requested. Didn't get to it, obviously have it in physical form. I thought it would be a really neat exploration of how history and genetics affect us in the modern day. That's not really what this is. First off, the author is not a historian. That's fine if it's gonna be more memoir. She's more of a creative writer, does experimental stuff, does more poetry. That should have been my first clue. In this book, she takes three genres and uses them interchangeably without real clear distinctions between them. There's history, there's memoir, and there's historical fiction. She doesn't make clear distinctions between any of that. And okay, that, that's fine to use any of the, those particular genres. It would even be fine to meld history and memoir. So as she's discovering this information, talking about that process and presenting that information. But where it gets really tricky is when she starts to ascribe thoughts, feelings, dialogue, etc., to the characters and doesn't make a distinction as to is this history like from a journal or something or is this just from her own imagination now i will say this she's a white woman and she's telling the story of several characters several people who are black now what first turned her onto this was the fact that when she was doing genealogical research and another family member had been doing genealogical research 
they had gotten to the point on one of the family lines where no research had been done beyond that. And it was where there was an M beside their name. And that M, they came to find out, meant mulatto. And so she became intrigued as to what that meant, what it meant for her family history and why, and it was clear, the family didn't do any more research because, oh, that meant there were black people in our history. And she wanted to push past that and learn more about what the decision was, how that part of her family came to start passing as white. If she had stuck with that, that would have been her story to tell. Instead, she gets up on her high horse so much throughout this and starts taking on all of these hurts. And she gets personally butthurt when some of her other very distantly related cousins, she calls them, have some problems with a white woman telling this story. There were so many times that I got viscerally angry at the way that she was portraying things, at the way that she was making herself a victim here. It was so wrong of her to try to tell this story. This book should not exist. One of her other cousins, very distantly related, should be the one to tell this story, not her. I'm gonna leave that there because otherwise I would get really, really, really even more worked up. Okay, so you just saw my lovely little one star. Yeah, that was a fun one. Next we have two, two and a half stars. So these three books brought down my average for the whole month. And the first of those is an arc and that is Wild Blood. I thought this was a fascinating concept hence why I requested this book as an arc, but nothing ever ended up making sense. And it just felt very weird and uncomfortable throughout the entire book, which is kind of similar to the other two and a half star read. And that is The Night Ship by Jess Kidd. Initially, I was really hooked into this setup and the writing. It was a fascinating setup and, and two dual timelines with these young kids. I was intrigued. How are they going to mesh together? And then things just kept getting weird. They just kept going through slice of life and they never really connected. And there was a lot that was not said that you're just supposed to assume. And it, some of the things in here were just very weird and uncomfortable. And I just didn't like this book. Next we get into my three star reads. I have four of those. We have Untethered Sky by Fonda Lee. It is a very short novella and it is my first introduction to Fonda Lee. And I feel like I gave her a bit of a disservice by having my introduction to her writing be this novella and not the Jade Legacy series, which is right here. Structurally, the narrative was sound. The writing was solid. There was no problems with the actual mechanics of the writing. The story itself, because it is so short, it's like 150 pages, you cannot go into depth on anything. And you could if you limited the time frame. But in this book, it starts basically when the main character is a child and then finishes about 15 or so years later. So that is a large expanse there and it didn't seem to have one driving conflict throughout it because there, there was partially that because she was one, she became this rider, you could say, because Griffins who they hunted killed her mom and brother. So there was a bit of revenge, but the plot does not build up to her taking specific revenge on that specific griffin who killed her family. And it just sort of ends. And I was like, okay, so what was the overall point? So not bad, but it just felt like an exercise in why was this written? Lies like wildfire. I thought this was an interesting premise. 
at first, but this type of book is not my favorite. I thought it was well done throughout the first, say 60% of it. You got the group coming together. They're trying to cover up something that happened and you know about this part. That's just not my favorite, but it was fairly well done. And then it shifts into something else that's sort of alluded to at the beginning of the book. And I just went, why? Why are we going to this? And the main character is really not likable at all. This was fine, definitely not the book for me. And I think some of the things at the end of it just were not well done. Then we have two arcs. The first of those is Lucha of the Night Forest. And I thought this was going to be really intriguing. When I first started reading this, I really liked how the author took Spanish words in this world that she made up. And if you knew the meaning of those words and she used them as names like Lucha and her love interest, Paz. Lucha means fight, Paz means peace. So I thought that was, it's so the way that she played on those words, fascinating. The world itself made no sense. It was incredibly strange, so strange, but it was well-written and it kept me reading. At no point did I think I was going to DNF, but I just, everything was so wibbly wobbly that I just kind of was like, where are we going with this? And then we get to the end and I went, that's where we're going? Okay. Apparently this is a series. Didn't realize that until I was looking it up later. Definitely not continuing in this series. Then we have Come See the Fair. I didn't hold out like super high hopes or have high expectations for this one, but I thought it might be an interesting read. It never really goes anywhere. First off, the atmosphere, fantastic. Gabrielle Savitt does an amazing job with the atmosphere in this book. That was the one redeeming factor that kept this from being a two and a half star. Other than that though, the magic system doesn't make sense. What's supposed, what the main character is supposed to learn also ends up being like, wait, what? She's going from one situation to another and neither are great. The things that are great, she abandons because this thing is so an enticing and appealing. And then there's some really harsh stuff that happened and I'm like, wait, you did what to that character? Hmm. And this is supposed to be a middle grade book. Okay. And then we have the last of the Love and series, Love and Luck. Technically this is book two. To think that this was written in between Love and Olives, no, Love and Gelato and Love and Olives, it doesn't make sense. It kind of fits like, oh, this is, I'm just tacking it on. Here's this third character. But this was actually the second book. This is obviously much shorter than both of those other two. And the love story aspect of it is not really there a lot. It's more of a an exploration between the relationships of the brother and sister, between Addie and Ian. And I thought that was really well done. And I really appreciated the hints at a love story that you see with another character. So there were hints of leap year vibes. I we had hoped that there would be more of them and there just was not a lot to this book. It just went really quickly. So hence a three star. All right, next we move to the three and a half star. And two of these are book box books and one of them is an SEASL book. And we start with Princess of Souls. And I will say, Princess of Souls and the Drowned Woods, in my mind, are kind of melding together because I did read them back to back before leaving on the trip. Princess of Souls, I believe, is a very rough Rapunzel retelling. Honestly, as I look at this and think about this, I don't remember all that much about it. I think it's very tropey YA, if I remember correctly. And there were some interesting things about it, but nothing really stands out. The Drowned Woods, even though they're both three and a half stars, I do remember that I rated this one a little bit higher. I have not read the other book that apparently the epilogue connects back to. A lot of people mentioned that that saved the book for them. I thought that this was an interesting take on mythology that I don't necessarily know a lot about. Wealth Welsh mythology, if I can say that. Ultimately, 
everything except for the two main characters felt really flat and surface level. And there's a character in here that they even mentioned, why did we bring him along? He didn't do anything. It's like, let's bring along this extra character so that they can be killed off and we don't have to sacrifice anything else. So this was very fast. It was tight, nothing wrong with it, but just nothing super extraordinary about it either. And then this one, the cost of knowing close to a four star, but not quite there. This I thought was an interesting premise. This, the main character after a tragic accident that claims the lives of his parents, he has, whenever he touches something, he sees the immediate future of that object. And obviously that's going to make him anxious and he doesn't want to touch anything. He definitely doesn't want to touch people that he loves like his brother and his relationship with his brother has really soured. And they live with their aunt who is fairly well off and lives in a gated community in a community where you wouldn't necessarily think that they quote unquote fit. And that does play a significant part in this. And I thought this was a fascinating take on a lot of stuff. I kept unfortunately getting annoyed by things that Morse kept repeating throughout this because if whatever you touch, you see the immediate future of, if you're going to touch your phone to open it up, you touch it, you see yourself opening it up so many times. She had to narrate through here that he canceled the vision of him swiping and then swiped or something like that, where he was sitting down on some pulling out a chair or something where he narrates that he cancels the vision of him doing something and then does it once or twice. That's totally fine. I get that you're establishing how he feels the environment that he's living in every single time throughout the entire book. Annoying. And so that did great on me a little bit. The way that this ends, and the fact that Brittany Morris went there, very well done. So incredibly close to a four star on this one. Next, we have another SEASL book, but this is one that I own, and that is This Poison Heart by Kaylin Barron. So my expectations going into this were lower because previous reviews that I had seen, read, put this as middling and said that they were disappointed. So I put my expectations lower really enjoyed this. I thought this was a fascinating look at a possibility for mythology and the way that Briseis in here, she's the main character has to deal with her basically unexplained powers and then getting this house and a lot of people knowing a lot of other stuff. Absolutely fascinating. I thought the whole book was really well done except for how the villain acted towards the end of the book. That seemed incredibly melodramatic and over the top. And that is, I think what took it down from a four and a half to a four star, but I will definitely be reading a sequel. Next we have one of the arcs that I had a physical copy of, and that is the Pearl Hunter by Maya Beck. I loved this. This was very well done. Hands down one of the best examples of this mythology type that I have seen. It's set in pre Shogun Japan and she's dealing with the consequences of her actions and how they've affected her twin sister. The thing that brought it down from say a four and a half to a four is the resolution because it's one of those that messes with time and situations and you never find out what happens really to a character or if what happened to them was real. And so that left it just really unsatisfying at the end, but overall solid book. Now we have several arcs. I did get through a large number of arcs, as I mentioned. So first off we have a bit of earth and it wasn't until I was close to finishing it that I realized that this is a retelling of the secret garden, which I really loved as a child. Of course, there are some problematic things about, the secret garden. I really enjoyed the character voice of the main character in this. She's very prickly and unlikable and she realizes that. And this, it just was a really fun read 
The reason that I'm rating this a little bit lower is just because this is one of the books that I listened to on one of my trips this month and some of the listening to these books was a little bit disjointed because things were happening around me. So I missed some stuff so I can't rate it necessarily as high as I might if I'd been able to dedicate full attention to it. That also goes for Ghosts, Toasts, and Other Hazards. I thought this was adorable and I really loved the voice of the main character here who is dealing with anxiety and her family falling apart because her stepdad decided to leave her mom and establish a completely new family and her younger sister is her stepdad's biological daughter so it's like her half sister but she says in there that she never considers herself her sister half of anything she copes with that by wanting to make sure that everybody is okay and cover up and take care of any possible hazard and this book is exploration throughout and how she deals with that next we have on air with zoe washington i remember at the time that i read the first book in this series i'd read another one i think the first book was part of an sasl list but on that list there were like two or three others that had to do with baking and this one the first one from the desk of zoe washington had the unfortunate timing to fall last in those series of middle grade students dealing with baking. She still loves baking in this and I really enjoyed the voice that Janae Marks gave to Zoe and how she's dealing with, okay this is the after of the things that happened in the first book and she's confronted with some ideas about the things that she believes about certain things and she shows a very realistic journey in learning about that and possibly changing her mind and growing as she, she learns more about certain things. I, th I thought that was well done. Uh, next, we have an e next we have an SEASL book and that is Fast Pitch by Nick Stone. I have read a few things by Nick Stone before, the titles of which I can't remember off the top of my head. I believe that Nick Stone wrote Dear Justice and Dear Martin, and I've read both of those. I thought this was a fairly solid book. I have to admit that I was listening to this on my flight over to the Mediterranean for my cruise. Even though I tried to stay awake, I didn't necessarily stay awake for certain parts. A lot of this does get muddled in my head, but it's very short. It's very fast paced. I love the emphasis on softball here. I think she does softball, not, yes, it is fast pitch softball. And so she is also looking into her family history because I think she had a, a grandfather. Well, I think her father, grandfather, and great grandfather were all involved in baseball somehow. And there was something that kept her great grandfather out, like he was accused of stealing something. So that's sort of the driving plot and who knows maybe I should technically read this again because you know I didn't get that much from it and I'm supposed to be evaluating it for SEASL but overall this was just fine. Then we get Hamra and the Jungle of Memories and I realized afterwards and also had a little bit of an inkling of it based on the cover that this is a Little Red Riding Hood retelling and it's set in Malaysia. And I just thought that the author did such a good job with this. So Hamra is having to deal with being an only child. Her grandmother has dementia and it's smack dab in the height of the pandemic. And both of her parents are like her mom, I think is a nurse and her dad is delivering PPE around and they all kind of forget her birthday. And she's the one that has to take care of her grandmother and her grandfather who's in poor health. He doesn't have dementia, but he can't take care of his wife. And so she ends up going into the jungle and things unfold from there. So there was an interesting melding of like reality, contemporary issues and fantasy. Cause there's one point where they get into the fantastical and she and her friend are, are both still wearing a mask and they're kind of like, 
Um, I guess we take off the mask here because I don't know that you need it around here and they're nervous about it. So I thought that was really well done. And just overall, solid book. Then we have Chaos and Flame by Tessa Gratton and Justina Ireland. Technically, if I'm being strict, this means that I haven't given every book written by Justina Ireland five stars, but this is a co-written book. And there were aspects of this book that I ate up. I thought were fantastic. The political intrigue in this book is so well done. So nuanced, so complicated, so intriguing. The rest of it, the whole YA, the romance part of it, not as captivating. So I really would like to know who wrote what, because I know Justina Ireland is a five-star author for me. I have never read from Tessa Gratton before, even though she's been on my list. So I definitely will be continuing on because it seems like the political intrigue part of it is definitely ramping up for this. Next, we have a book that I almost DNF'd, but managed to be a four star. And that is The Fairy Bargains of Prospect Hill. The synopsis reminded me of Nettle and Bone. Throw out that comparison. The fact that there are sisters in here, that's the only comparison. First part of the book is so slow moving. I, at a certain point, I'm just like, I mean, it's fine, but I'm not really compelled to continue reading. And I still need to finish the certain number of books to finish my TBR. I almost just set this down just because it moved so slowly. There was really good stuff in there that it was building character wise for the two sisters. However, it wasn't, it was like a very slow, slow build. But once it got moving, once one of the characters entered the Fae realm, I saw all of the work that Rowena Miller put in. All of that work that she put in into this very slow build had such a payoff at the end. And I, by the end, I finished the book and I went, I actually really enjoyed that. It was very surprising because it's almost like it sneaks up on you. So hence why this gets four stars. Another book that completely surprised me because I had such low expectations for it, Mindwalker by Kate Dillon. This is a sci-fi. Sci-fi, not really my genre. It takes a special kind of sci-fi to be something that I really, really enjoy. This apparently is one of those. This is action. This is like watching an action movie in space. There's not a lot of character depth in here. Totally fine. I could not look away from this book. The plot, the intricacies, really tight. Character work, not so much. And there was a reveal. There was something fishy about one of the characters and I'm like, hmm, not so sure about that. I turned out to be right that there was not, there was something fishy about that one character, but it was so wibbly wobbly and intricate in there that she pulled over the reveal on me and really well done. I've since discovered that this is a series, but sort of like companion novels. I didn't like it enough to continue in the series though. So one and done for me in this series. Now we get to the four and a half star reads and I'm starting off with an ALC, an advanced listening copy that I had through Libro FM and that is Miles Morales Suspended. I picked this up to fulfill a prompt for the one of the readathons that I was doing and I just thought that this was so well done. There were two narrators, one for the poetry section of Mile, what Miles was writing and the other for the prose section which was like the all-knowing narrator portion of it, the back and forth and just how this was talked about throughout the day, really well done. So in contrast to that very low rated book that I talked about before, we have something that is phenomenal. And that is African Town, co-written by Irene Latham and Charles Waters. So here is the author duo here. And one thing that I appreciated uh, in their author's note, both of them approached this story with great care and great awareness that 
this was not their story as in their heritage to tell. And so they made sure to research this to have documentation for just about everything that they pulled upon to put in this story. And you can tell the care that they took with that. They also didn't try to mesh genres or anything like that. This is narrative, nonfiction, uh, poetry, I should say. It's written in verse and it tells the story of the last Africans brought over and they were brought over illegally um, and became slaves and about the late 1850s and their generations. This was something that I really didn't know before and so I learned a lot through reading this and I also appreciated the craft and the care that they took and the uniqueness in the voices because each of the different characters that they talked about throughout these generations had a different voice, had a different cadence to how they were speaking in this, in these poems, had different, they used different styles of poetry to tell these stories, which is phenomenal. And this was just so well done. Next we have one that was really good. And my expectations for it went way up after reading an arc that I got written by this same author. And that is Keep in My Pocket by Adriana Cuevas. In this book, she, uh, I think, um, if I remember, his name is Kumba. And he is about to turn 12 and be sent off to some sort of training camp or something for the regime in Cuba when they are first, when Fidel is first basically cementing power and his grip on everything. And his family, like, they're determined they do not want anything to do with this. And so to help keep him out of that, they forge papers and things like that and get him over to the United States. But he has to go without his family. And so he's 12 years old and he's having to deal with all of that struggle from back in Cuba. And she does spend a portion, I think the first, I'd say 15, or so percent of the book in Cuba um, dealing with all that fear and that oppression that sort of really tense atmosphere he's trying to escape it he's trying to make his way in this very strange world in the United States and he's feeling bereft without his family and he's trying to like survive basically and I just think this was very well done, very well written. Next, we have one of my 23 and 23 books, and that is A Seed in the Sun by Ada Salazar. This was so good and so gut-wrenching. I believe this one is also, yes, this one is also in verse, and it tells the story of a girl who was the daughter of farm workers in the 1960s in California during a time when they were striking for better rights for these farm workers and it just is so well crafted and just I'm running out of words to talk about it in detail and my battery's blinking definitely need to give this one a read next we have one that took me completely by surprise and that is silver in the bone by Alexandra Bracken uh, my only other experience with her is with lore I did not like lore However, I held out hope for this book because the writing in lore was solid. I just didn't like character choices and plot choices. This take on the Arthurian legend was so imaginative and so well done. The characters are complex and really intriguing and the plot wrapped up and there was a twist at the end that had me really thankful that this is a series. Next we have another pleasant surprise and that is The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. This was my tailored book recommendations book for the month. And this was very much a slice of life with a little bit of magical realism just thrown in there. It's not the main point. The tagline is that there is a troublesome ghost that just won't let go. But this is so much slice of life starting around the fall of 2019. She tells a little bit of her life previously, 
but the main part of the narrative starts in fall of 2019 and it goes through a whole year so fall of 2020 and so the pandemic so this takes place in Minneapolis and so the obviously the George Floyd the riots and the way that the native communities interact with the black and brown communities it just I loved it this was like a warm hug of a book next we have one that I'm very glad very glad was a four and a half star read because if it hadn't been I would have been I would have doubted my whole thing that my fantasy tastes align with Jade from Jade Ray Reads and that is The Rune of King by Jen Lyons. I got, it got off to a rough start. I listed this as audiobook because there are separate narrators for the two stories and for the footnotes and I wanted to get that interruption at the right time of the footnotes and so I listened to this as audiobook and I'll be listening to the series as an audiobook. It got off to a rough start because I started listening to it on the last segment of my flight home and I was a lot more tired than I thought I was and so I'd be paying attention and this book is already confusing and I'd get to a point and I'd be listening to a scene and go I have no idea how we got here. <laughs> so I ended up having to go way back and listening to it and so a little bit of a rough start but this book defies easy explanation of what's going on. There's still so many things in here that I have no idea how they connect. That you've got the stories, you've got the different characters and there's reincarnation and there's very murky veil between life and death but I just this story is so unique and so captivating. I loved it and I'm so glad that I'm going to be reading this series. Before we get to my five star, I'm briefly going to talk about the last book that I read in the month and I just finished it last night at the time of filming. I do not remember what I rated it. I did put it through Copile, but that is The Fox Love King. The whole time reading this, I couldn't figure out how I felt about it. I can't put my finger on something that's wrong with the narrative, but I can't also find something that I like. So the death magic, not really my thing. It's very weird and I still don't understand how the death magic in here works. There's a little bit of political intrigue. I can't really describe whether or not it's well done and I just read this book and I just can't put my finger on whether I like it or not. And that just felt weird at the end of the book. There's a lot of stuff that's solid about this book, but I am not going to be continuing in the series. So that brings me to my five star books. And I'm going to talk about the one that I read in the second half of the month first. And that is Nick Blake and the Remarkables, The Manifesto Prophecy. This is the middle grade debut for Angie Thomas, the author of The Hate You Give. This book was so well done. This book took the magic trope. It took the, I don't know, like the whole, the mythology becoming real idea and everything was executed perfectly. Nick is such a fantastic character and she has to deal with her whole life being turned on its head and how do I think about this person who raised me for years, but sort of under false pretenses, but they, I know that they love me, but they did this thing. How do I rectify that? And this whole aspect of who she really is and how she's dealing with it. And her friend, fantastic, love him, adorable. Her twin brother, really well done as well. The characters all are so unique and so well crafted amongst themselves. The secondary characters are well done as well. And I, I tried to think of another way to say, well, I cannot wait to get a physical copy of this book. That brings me to the best book that I've read. And I am pretty sure that it's kind of funny because I literally, after I read Benjamin Banneker and Us, like I looked at my books for the month and I went, I need a win. I need a dramatic palate cleanser. I ended up going for, from the worst book, probably of the year, hopefully of the year, 
to possibly the best book of the year. Talk about a palate cleanser, as long as the lemon trees grow. This is incredible. The way I just, I got so wrapped up in this book. I could not put it down. It brought me to tears. I mentioned that in my, my uh, mid-year freak out tag. I struggle to find the words to describe the absolute masterpiece that this book is. It is not easy. There's really hard stuff talked about in this book. It deals with trauma. It deals with complex character interactions. I'm going to have to figure out how to talk about this because if this stays as my number one book of the year, I'm going to need to be more coherent. I thought giving time after reading it would help me be able to describe it better. Mm -mm. It's just that spectacular. There you go. There's all of the books, the 34 books that I read this month. I have no idea how I did that. Thanks so much for watching. I hope to see you in the next one.